enlarge the boundaries of science, new atomic knowledge must emerge out of the darkness, out of the unknown. Prepared as the vast outdoor laboratory, eager, tense, the scientists wait. Installed as a new atomic weapon, instruments near and far are ready. The stage is set. High is this zero tower, poised for the world's sixth atomic explosion. the darkness is now a pillar of cloud by day, symbol of Operation Sandstone. To the success of Operation Sandstone, all branches of the armed services and all civilian components of Joint Task Force 7 contributed. But this account is the story of the Navy's contribution. At the beginning, it's low-lying islands strung like beads on a necklace. Any way talk is like many other atolls of the Marshall Islands. Surf-washed, coral reef, studded with a regular pattern of coconut groves laid out long ago. Down come the stately palm trees, cleared away as the tangled thicket of tropical growth. Out of this isolated wilderness, the Army engineers are gouging a permanent proving ground for the Atomic Energy Commission. This early phase and later phases required great quantities of supplies. Who delivered them? The Navy. How much? Better than 57,000 measurement tons. At Port Wainimi and at many other ports of the naval establishment, the preparation resembles loading of an invasion fleet and the details are as fully masked behind the curtain of security as if there were to be a military invasion. At this juncture, Operation Sandstone is top secret. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, the work of setting up a proving ground proceeds at swift pace. The march of events in a tight time schedule is abundant proof that inter-service planning has been good and that the coordination of civilian and military groups is excellent. Helping to preserve this coordination is a flotilla of Navy and Engineers small craft performing essential, though not spectacular, tasks. Need of an abundance of small boats, a virtual water taxi system for supplies, equipment, and personnel has been recognized from the experience of earlier atomic tests, Operation Crossroads. Mother of this busy brood of small craft is the Comstock, a landing ship dock which serves as the headquarters of the boat pool and is a self-contained flexible repair facility. operations of a Navy patrol bomber detachment, extensive maintenance and repair activities are established ashore. Air facilities had already been developed here during World War II, when anyway talk, wrested from the Japanese by amphibious operations, had become an important air base. Anchored a short distance offshore is the tender Gardener's Bay, serving as a sea drome for far-ranging seaplanes assigned to many security missions. Thirsty fuel tanks are filled with high octane, but this is only one of the thousands of logistics problems that had to be met. The pace of 
the work increases. Here again, logistics play a major role. Fuel for the machines, tools for the men, cement by the multiple ton, all brought thousands of miles to create for the Atomic Energy Commission at this remote outpost an atomic test ground. Dominating the proving ground and its many installations are the 200-foot zero towers and the 75-foot photo towers. Disposed at various distances from the zero towers, experimental blast structures of the Navy's Bureau of Yards and Docks go up. Able to beach itself during loading procedures, an LSM has been chosen for the task of laying a submarine cable, another Navy function. The armored cable is to link the islands of the proving ground into a timing and instrumentation network. The network is to be of great dimension and yet must satisfy demands for precision rarely ever before attempted or achieved in experiments of such scope. Under the supervision of a Coast Guard officer, experienced in cable work, the job of laying nearly a million feet of cable is accomplished despite many obstacles. Splicing the cable, even with personnel expressly trained, is the crucial factor in meeting the operational deadline. Many hands make light work, although the cable weighs almost a ton per thousand feet. While these advance echelons are busily engaged, back in the United States, the main body of Joint Task Force 7 gets underway. Departure of the task force signifies that after six months of preparation, the critical phase of the operation at last is at hand. Stowed in the holds are thousands of delicate instruments and great new quantities of supplies. Aboard are large groups of scientists, military units participating in atomic weapon development, and the command staff organized on war-tested principles of joint operation. Lashed to the decks, our aircraft being ferried to various points on the 4,500-mile voyage. Underway procedure follows rigid military precautions. Atomic secrets, atomic weapons, atomic know-how, all are precious freight that give ominous meaning to sleek destroyers keeping vigil on the flanks of the task force. Ships are for logistics, but ships are for security, too. The converted seaplane tender, Curtis, provides definite facilities needed on her present mission. Routine tasks going on topside belie the secret work being performed in the shops and laboratories below. The skipper doesn't say much, but he knows. You might draw additional significance from these spruce marines chosen for special security tasks afloat and ashore. And the gun crews hold a practice exercise. Exercise? Yes, but this is another version of exercise for all hands and by captain's order, no less. But there are many other opportunities for recreation and relaxation as the ships move closer and closer to the tropics. Serving as the principal laboratory ship and as home and headquarters of the scientific staff is the Albemarle, sister ship of the Curtis. Like other ships of the force, she is a weather station gathering data for daily forecasts. Later, she'll be integrated into an extensive weather network. Now this is the way a deck is scrubbed. And this is the way a deck is uh, decorated. But while the work of the deck force sometimes coincides with leisure for the passengers sunning themselves in the balmy sea air, the ship is taut and happy. Below, the scientific staff spends long hours consulting on technical and operational problems. 
With the armed services in supporting roles, it is the civilian scientific group drawn from many laboratories but directed by the Atomic Energy Commission that is at the heart of the experiments. These men will determine the relative merits of three new weapons. Many tasks of the scientists demand air-conditioned laboratories. Temperature and humidity control and dust-free conditions are essential, particularly while delicate instrument assemblies are being made. Thousands of spare parts are stored by the scientists, but skilled machinists of the ship's force often manufacture spares in emergencies. Almost equally as many tasks are being performed aboard the carrier Bayroko. Radiological safety classes conducted underway afford an example of the excellence of the operation from the standpoint of national preparedness and security. Officers drawn from all the armed services are briefed on radiological dangers and trained in the techniques and problems of radiological safety. Various projects also provide opportunities for testing under field conditions many new instruments, operational procedures, and decontamination and safety technique. The laboratories on the Biroco, hence, are important at all stages of the operation. <music> Meanwhile, aboard the flagship, Mount McKinley, the task force commander, General Hull, has the fount of Crossroads experience in his deputies, Rear Admiral Parsons, the Navy's Director of Atomic Defense, and Major General Kepner, the Commander of Air Forces, both Admiral Blandy's deputies in Operation Crossroads. As a command ship, the McKinley has earned her title, the Mighty Mac. She again proves her ability to tackle a difficult job and get it done. No, not one job, but hundreds of different jobs. She is the command post the Information Center, the Weather Central, the Naval Task Group Headquarters, and the Station of the Air Commander. In and out of her communications rooms flow thousands of messages coordinating the task force. Because of the nature of the operation, encrypted traffic is heavy. But busy as are her communications channels, there is stress on all measures of security, too, and radar operators alert at their posts bespeak caution and preparedness. But as the main body of the task force heads for the forward areas, there is now an increased emphasis on airlift, particularly to Kwajalein, busy hive of air activity. Considerable rehabilitation has been conducted of facilities little used since World War II or Operation Crossroads. Airlift is important in the logistics plan for a telescope's time and abbreviates distance linking the continental United States to the Marshall Islands. High priority freight and important personnel are sped to many destinations by aircraft of the military air transport services. Airlift gives further flexibility to a complicated operations plan, permitting critical materials to be delivered with minimum delay and allowing difficult schedules to be met. To the Air Force has been assigned the majority of air duties, and here at Kwajalein are based the principal air components. Included in the flight plan are Navy air-sea rescue units whose amphibians are equipped with small boats that can be parachuted to the surface of the sea. Navy converted B-17s are used for anti-submarine patrol. Hundred and fifty-six miles away, the airstrips at Anyweetalk Island are being prepared for drone aircraft operations, also conducted by the Air Force. Drone barriers are erected and searchlights installed. Certain areas of the proving ground are leveled, 
but at other points, earth barricades are formed to absorb or deflect the expected blast pressures. Activity reaches high pitch. Now hundreds of jobs are being done at once. Work, work, work. Anyway, talk. Ho! Oh. The main body of the task force arrives and anchors in the lagoon. The ships are anchored with an easy sight of the zero towers. At last, it is evident what a major part the Navy plays, why nearly three-fifths of the task force of 10,000 are drawn from Navy ranks. To supply and house, feed and guard an operation of this sort requires various elements of sea power, tankers, destroyers and destroyer escorts, transports, tenders, amphibious craft, repair ships, refrigerator and provision ships, and a host of specialized craft. In this tropical lagoon, a virtual community afloat, the ships compose a versatile and powerful force capable of many tasks, doing all the tasks assigned, doing them well. Passengers delivered 2,700. Food delivered nearly 2,000 tons. Drinking water manufactured for units not self-sustaining, 22 million gallons. Diesel fuel delivered, better than a million and a half gallons. Motor gasoline delivered, more than 500,000 gallons. Aviation gasoline delivered, more than 600,000 gallons. Black fuel delivered, nearly six and a third million gallons. and equipment go ashore. Many phases of the instrumentation projects must still be carried out. As the scientific groups reach their outdoor laboratory, they find that each zero island is being transformed into a virtual tabletop for the experiments. Work goes on apace. Rigors of the tropical climate make each new project a challenge, each day's work a trial, and each completed task a triumph. job be done on time? It must be done on time. But there is sweat beneath a pitiless sun, and the coral sand, now robbed of its vegetation, provides many a trap for even those vehicles designed to operate on difficult terrain. Difficulty enough? No, sir. Where the loose soil has not been stabilized, wind pelts the workers with a hurricane of sand, making windscreens a necessity for many projects. In a dual experiment by Los Alamos scientists to detect the presence of neutrons at various distances from the zero tower, 
cables are set out. One cable to which flotation planks have been attached for the sake of buoyancy is hauled out to the lagoon. These balsa rafts, lowered from the Albemarle, serve as platforms for sample containers that are to be moored to the cable like a string of tiny islands. Also oriented from the foot of the zero tower, a second cable experiment is set up with sample containers mounted on tripods and variously shielded. Like a gigantic clothesline, the cables with neutron detecting samples attached will be reeled in after the detonation. Thousands of man hours are consumed by jobs that are sheer physical labor. Soil stabilization is necessary to minimize dust and to solidify earth mounds that will absorb or deflect blasts. Coaxial cables and the hundreds of instruments must be dust-free if they're to render the precise results demanded by the operation. To avoid dust, many instruments are installed a minimum interval before abandonment of the zero island. Since data must be precise, each wall of these blockhouses gets an identifying number. This structure is a reference too. Tower cameras aimed at the fireball stage of the explosion will include it as a known measurement. Important to the architects of an atomic age is the study of blast effects and blast deflection in relation to various surfaces, angles, and structural techniques. These strange objects preformed in the United States and shipped to Wenewetok for installation by the Army engineers comprise a test conducted by the Navy's Bureau of Yards and Docks. The structures are of different shape and size, set in different footings, and disposed differently to the zero tower. Hence, a great variety of data will result. To make certain that atomic secrets are safeguarded is the job of the security force, a combined civilian military group who have charge of segregated areas and who make certain that access to these areas is granted only to authorized personnel. Many jobs remain to be done in the short interval remaining. As preparation for future tests, animal chambers of the Navy's Bureau of Medicine and Surgery are being given a limited trial ashore and in the lagoon. Thermal plaques of the Bureau of Ships contain colored and glossed material, plastics, and fabrics. Gamma stations have collimating tubes correctly aimed to channel radiation from the fireball and the rising cloud to which ionization chambers within the shelter must be aligned. This is another experiment of the Atomic Energy Commission that requires precision and infinite care. Access ports of the gamma stations are shielded with cans of boric acid to absorb stray neutrons. Military personnel, whose tasks for the present are completed, are being evacuated to a safe distance at sea. Once afloat, they are again briefed in shipboard procedures to guard against all emergencies. Security measures are even more painstaking as events go ahead with slow crescendo. Radio facsimile brings weather information that is added to the great flow of communications traffic aboard the Mount McKinley. Only with such a flow of information can General Hull and his staff coordinate the great undertaking. This position of the Navy units is reported by Rear Admiral Denebrink, the Naval Task Group Commander, while Major General Kepner gives the air status. With the staff so readily assembled for discussion of interrelated problems, flexibility is imparted to a complex operations plan. Weather information is vital, for weather is the crux of the time schedule. Upon the forecasters depend many of the command decisions now to be made. Long-range weather planes rove great areas of the Pacific to study wind structures, cloud formations, and temperatures. Weather information has high priority as communications traffic. 
But knowing the burdens that would be placed on communications, particularly on radio teletype and radio telephone circuits, engineers of the armed services have planned their networks well. Units afloat and ashore are bound together by networks that demonstrate daily an ingenious efficiency. At Kwajalein, Air Force photoplanes are fueled and camera installations completed for full-scale dress rehearsal. imparted to the photo teams the precision needed for difficult photographic assignments. Of the photo towers at the proving ground, most interesting is that built on a coral shoal in the middle of the lagoon. Here, batteries of motion picture cameras running at various speeds to record the phenomena of atomic explosion will all be remotely triggered. Augmenting them are banks of still cameras. Last-minute projects are now being accomplished by scientific groups still on the Zero Island. Blast harps strung with soft wire are set out to give direct readings of blast pressures. Blast cans, called penny gauges, another economical method of obtaining direct readings of the blast, are put in place. Film, sensitive to gamma rays, is being distributed at hundreds of places, some exposed and some concealed in the blast structures. Navy experiments are many. This channeled device called a film howitzer will provide data on gamma penetration when angles are involved. Nearby, snugly tied in glass cloth, is a packet of medical samples. Between steel plates, representing various hull thicknesses, film will measure radiation penetration in relation to shielding. The Bureau of Ships also wants to study thermal effects and determine decontamination procedures in relation to these racks of paints, varnishes, enamels, woods, and plastics, all to be exposed to atomic explosions. As a guide in the design of modern ships, the Bureau of Ships needs an abundance of information and the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery searching for a simple, inexpensive, but accurate index of exposure to gamma radiation is testing these crystals that will change color according to the amount of irradiation. Such tests may have far-reaching effects in the exploration of many phases of an atomic era. Shielding afforded by cement is being studied too. Biological assay material exposed for Navy medical studies is guarded from tropic heat and humidity by wrappings of glass wool. Inside the timing station, the last brick is fitted into the massive lead coffin that shields the delicate recording cameras from unwanted radiation. Elsewhere on the Zero Island, structures are sealed. Sentinel against the sky, this colossus of a zero tower is a symbol of a job done, a weapon installed, a laboratory ready. Time is short. Security guards and the scientists are the last to leave. ships now stand away from the Zero Island, although still within the lagoon.
Behind is the giant laboratory, mute, deserted. The detonation party races from Zero Island to Zero Island to close and lock the switches that nip the Zero Tower to the distant control panel. By radio telephone, frequent reports go to the scientific director. Nightfall brings a new assortment of tasks, each one important. Now is no time for let up. The never sleeping eyes of radar reach out, lest there be intruders into the deserted restricted areas. Communications has a heavy responsibility. The entire task force has been stirred to intense activity. At any we talk, in eerie darkness, the Air Force drones take off with a perfection born of diligence and skill. They must plunge into the radioactive cloud on sampling missions. Nearby at the control island, a telemeter tower looms up, its antenna ready to receive signals from the blast footings that scientists within the telemetering station can record and interpret. The detonation party arrives and mounts to the control station, ready for X-ray day and the world's sixth atomic explosion. What secrets will be plucked from the darkness and the unknown? At what new frontiers does man stand? Stand by for final time signal. Stand by for final time signal. At the sound of the gong, it will be minus 20 seconds. Stand by. At the sound of the gong, it will be minus 10 seconds. Minus. 10 against the morning sky. Drones start into the radioactive cloud to gather air samples. Helicopters head toward the Zero Island. and the drones come home, their spectacular jobs done. They have snatched radioactive samples from the cloud in special filter traps, samples that will give an index to weapon efficiency.
each person returning from exposure to radioactive areas, whether that exposure was in the sky or on the ground, must be carefully monitored. Among the many missions performed by the Navy helicopters, swift recovery of samples from the water and land cables proves the versatility of these craft. The samples are dropped to neutron measurement crews on the deck of the Albemarle and rushed to the ship's laboratories for counting procedures. Helicopter shuttle service was a great boon to the scientific project. Small groups go ashore for recovery of instruments and inspection of installations. They are clad in disposable clothing and wear masks to prevent the ingestion of radioactive dust. Monitors guide them, restrict their movements, and limit their stay. The timing station has weathered the fury of atomic blast and has withstood the terrific ground shock. Vital records of the experiments are safe within. Everywhere are the telltale exhibits of the violence of the explosion. Some tell a vivid story and need no further explanation. Others require careful scrutiny. Assembly of data begins swiftly, although there must be no lingering in radioactive areas. Navy medical men gather up sample packets that will provide diversified material for careful laboratory analysis. As data is computed aboard the Albemarle, even a simple beer can renders an account of its adventure on the Zero Island. Weight of water in the crumpled can will give the scientist a direct reading of blast pressures from pre-computed tables. Other data has been recorded on negatives, which may be examined like this one. As busy as the scientists have been before, they still lose no time now in analyzing the results and compiling figures needed by the test director and the Atomic Energy Commission. But the proof testing of two additional new weapons remains. Stand by for Yoke Day. Stand by for Zebra Day. To the men of the task force, might unleashed by new atomic weapons is great indeed. But greater still is the might of a mighty nation working together. The Atomic Energy Commission's new proving grounds and these new tests were made possible by teamwork. And while this account stressed the story of the Navy's contribution, it was a contribution to a joint task force and to a united effort in Operation Sandstone.